In the state of Lebanon, there is a colossal megalithic structure of ancient times called Baalbek. There you will find entire stone blocks weighing from 800 to 1000 tons each. The foundations of the Temple of Jupiter in the ancient city of Baalbek, also known as Heliopolis, have been subject to much speculation ranging from UFOs to various human civilizations. It is believed that humans simply couldn't have achieved such a feat, and indeed, this is a fact. In this video, I will present these facts to you, and after watching it, you will look at this place differently. The city of Baalbek was once one of the holiest places on earth, and its temples were among the wonders of the ancient world. But in our time, Baalbek is forgotten by all, ravaged and erased from the face of the earth, and we can only observe its remaining intact part. Baalbek has fallen into complete oblivion and some archaeological books don't mention it at all. Among the archaeological treasures of Baalbek, enormous columns stand out, which would have been impossible to create without modern technology, lifting and construction mechanisms that hardly existed back then. Or did they exist after all? And the most important question we can ask ourselves today is, who built this gigantic and seemingly impossible structure for the ancient builders? That's exactly what today's video is about. It should be noted that the city of Heliopolis, also known as Baalbek, was located at the crossroads of many trade routes of the Middle East and Asia Minor, which made it a busy center. The city itself is very ancient, officially founded in 133 from the creation of the world. According to the Star Temple, about 7 for 100 years ago, one would expect numerous references to it and its remarkable structures and ancient written documents, but surprisingly, there are none. Although the city and its surroundings were occasionally mentioned, there is no mention of any gigantic structures. This region was first mentioned in ancient Egyptian inscriptions of the 14th century BC, but simply as one of the territories that fell under the rule of ancient EGYPT, without mentioning the city located there. In the 9th century BC, battles took place in this area between the Assyrians and the coalition of the Syrian kingdoms, as a result of which a list of cities that were obliged to pay tribute to Assyria was compiled. Baalbek is not on this list and there is no mention of giant structures in Assyrian texts. The first mention of the city appears during the time of Alexander the Great, who visited the area and even made sacrifices in the local temple. However, there are no records of giant stones from this period either. Furthermore, after the campaign of the Roman general Pompey, the region was surveyed and described by the renowned geographer Strabo. He described nothing remarkable, just a hilly area populated by local farming communities, with no mention of giant constructions. The fact remains that the ancients were unaware of these stones. Moreover, even after the construction of the Temple of Jupiter on these megaliths, neither Romans nor Greeks wrote anything about them or boasted of their great achievement, as if it were a matter of course. Such a foundation was needed, so they built it, but in reality, it was a highly complex technological process. How could they have accomplished it in ancient times? Those who have visited Baalbek are forever astonished by the scale of the megaliths used in constructing this monumental edifice, particularly the gigantic podium surrounding the Temple of Jupiter. First, let me read you the official information about how the pieces of stone weighing from 500 to 1000 tons were carved. The splitting of the stone was carried out by driving wedges into the stone. A suitable flat surface is required to facilitate the splitting of a stone or block. Then holes of the appropriate diameter and depth are drilled, after which special steel wedges are carefully inserted into the holes. As the wedges are driven, cracks form in the stone and eventually it splits. However, this is not as easy as it seems at first glance. Before splitting a stone in this way, it must be quarried. It is unlikely that you would be able to extract a 500 ton piece of stone from a quarry. But let's assume that they succeeded. Then, it is additionally given the desired rectangular shape by the same method, followed by grinding and removing all traces of drilled holes for wedges. 
Here is a photo of the footprints left by the deleted blocks. Obviously, they extracted them by some other unknown method, because extracting the stone from the bedrock without technology seems impossible. But let's not go into details. Another, no less difficult question arises, the transportation of these units to the installation site. Some might say that they could gradually roll them on wooden or stone rollers, plus with the help of the labor of thousands of slaves. But if you take into account blocks weighing 50 tons, then even wooden or stone rollers may not withstand the load. Now imagine that you are dealing with thousands of tons. Can you imagine such a figure? If not, let me help you. That's about 1,000 cars. Even the world's largest Bellas weighs 800 tons, and now imagine it compared to a human. Do you understand the picture? Any stone skating rink, not to mention wooden ones, would simply turn to dust under such a load. Okay, let's say we've sorted out the transportation. But let's assume that in some fantastic way they managed to get these blocks to the right place. Next, they need to be lifted and installed to a height of up to 8 meters. Ramps, rollers, and ropes are not suitable here. What kind of rope will be needed to pull out such a block? Since their weight will push in the opposite direction, that is, downhill. How many thousands of slaves and what type of rope will it take? Then the block must be adjusted and aligned to the nearest millimeter. Isn't that a bit much for ancient slaves? And then I wondered what means exist today to lift such masses. In conventional construction, cranes with a lifting capacity of about 50 tons are mainly used, which is enough for most types of construction. In some cases, cranes with a lifting capacity of 200 tons are used, which is the maximum limit. However, there are indeed mobile cranes with lifting capacities of 800 tons and up to a maximum of 1400 tons, but they are produced in limited numbers, and such machines can be counted on the fingers worldwide. These machines can lift their maximum weight at minimal jib extension and to relatively low heights, essentially allowing them to just move the objects. What I mean to say is that even in modern construction, despite all the possibilities, people build buildings that do not require individually manufactured, expensive machinery. But according to scientists, ancient people didn't seek the easy way out. Moving on, let's talk about the columns of the Temple of Jupiter. Unfortunately, only six columns remain from the temple, each standing at a height of 22 meters and with a diameter of about 3 meters. They are all polished like glass, yet not a single tool was found in the quarries that could have been used for this work. Calculating the weight of one column is difficult. Using an online calculator to determine the volume of a cylinder, I got 846 cubic meters. Multiplying this by the average density of stone per cubic meter gives us 1500 tons. So, a column weighing 1500 tons still needs to be set upright without crushing itself under its own weight and the icing on the cake would be the top stones. If a single block weighing 1,000 tons and a column weighing 1,500 tons can still somehow be explained by official scientists to someone unfamiliar with construction and unwilling to think critically, how do we explain the weight of one section, which is about 80 tons, being lifted to a height of 20 to meters? If we abstract ourselves from all the teachings forced upon us since school, the arguments of scientists about the primitive methods of construction used for this complex begin to seem simply foolish and implausible. The ancient complex of Baalbek in Lebanon is constructed from the world's largest stone blocks and is included in the Guinness Book of Records for many parameters. Archaeologists attribute it to structures of the Roman era. However, facts indicate that the initial builders of the complex were not Romans at all, but rather a highly advanced civilization whose technological capabilities even astonish modern builders. Who could have built such a gigantic structure and for what purpose? You'll try to answer this question right now, and most importantly, those we'll be discussing could have built not only Baalbek, but also other megalithic structures around the world. Before you is a map of findings of giant human remains in North America, created by the Society of Sehok, which deals with questions about human history. Each figure marks the place, and the case was recorded in the press and stored in the archives of cities in these areas. In reality, the total number of hidden giant skeletons is estimated to be in the thousands, along with tens and hundreds of thousands of artifacts. 
For example, there is a giant from San Diego, which was allegedly acquired by the Smithsonian Institution for $500 in 1895. However, they later claimed it was a hoax. You can find articles containing intriguing details. How reliable are all such reports? Some articles claim that thousands of giant human skeletons were hidden from the public by the Smithsonian Institution founded by the U.S. Congress in the 19th century as a research and educational institute, together with the museum complex. Other publications talk about the destruction of the remains of giants to protect the prevailing theory of human evolution. The most interesting reports suggest that the Smithsonian Institution admitted to destroying thousands of giant human skeletons in the early 20th century. It was like this. The United States Supreme Court has ordered the declassification of documents dating back to the early 19th century proving that the organization was involved in a major historical cover-up, showing that giant human remains numbering in the tens of thousands have been found all over America and were destroyed on the orders of high-ranking officials to protect the theory of evolution. Suspicions by the American Institute of Alternative Archaeology that the Smithsonian Institution had destroyed thousands of giant human remains prompted the Smithsonian Institution to sue them for defamation and an attempt to damage the reputation of the 168-year-old institution. According to James Charward, a representative of the Institute of Alternative Archaeology, new details surfaced during the trial when several Smithsonian insiders acknowledged the existence of documents allegedly proving the existence of tens of thousands of human skeletons approximately two and a half to 17 meters high. For various reasons, traditional archaeology does not want to admit the existence of these giants. The turning point in the case was the demonstration of a human femur measuring one and a half meters as proof of the existence of such gigantic human bones. This evidence broke through the protection of the institution's defenders, as the bone was stolen from this organization by one of the high-ranking curators in the mid-1930s, who kept it all his life and wrote a letter on his deathbed. It's terrible what they do to people, he wrote. We are hiding the truth about the ancestors of mankind, about the giants who inhabited the earth in the past. As mentioned in the Bible and other ancient texts, what happened next is unknown, but this story is sure to have a sequel. Meanwhile, official scientists continue to assert that there are no genuine remains of giants in any museum in the world. All reports of discoveries coming many times a year from different countries are considered fairy tales and fabrications devoid of scientific knowledge. In general, on the topic of ancient giants, one can often meet skeptics who consider this phenomenon to be just another speculation of conspiracy theorists. But this is not the case at all. Otherwise, I don't understand how huge books were created in the past. It would be difficult for one person to lift them. Such a book could weigh 40 to 50 kilograms, which made it uncomfortable to read. Perhaps you think that such books were created to write a lot of text and information. Look at the font and its scale. The same goes for swords. How much strength would it take to just lift such a sword, let alone swing it? Guns, do you really think that people fired such guns by two people, one aiming and the other pulling the trigger? Musical instruments. How could an ordinary person play such a violin? Maybe the truth is closer than we think. Maybe everything is hidden in plain sight. Perhaps these are the giants depicted in ancient statues and engravings. This giant is next to an ordinary person, and it is not a child. Here's another one a man with a beard, knee high to a giant. These statues are located in the Velmen Cathedral. A lion is like a pet, no taller than a knee, and cattle are also no taller than a knee. An adult man next to a giant. Look at these athletes, the horses are below their waist. For comparison, here are photos of horses with people of our height. Surely you have also paid attention to the various Egyptian inscriptions on the papyrus, stone walls, and so on. These drawings depict small and large people. What could these manuscripts on the walls mean if not evidence of the existence of giant humans? Carved statues of Egyptian gods next to which ordinary people. Of course, many will object that these sculptures are allegorical, figurative comparisons of characters. But maybe in those days sculptures, engravings, and paintings were not created to such an extent from the point of view of symbolism. 
Maybe they have more common sense than art historians are trying to explain. If we acknowledge the existence of such giants in the past, it immediately becomes clear how they could have built such great megalithic structures in ancient times. My name is Professor Aristotle. Until we meet again on the channel, may common sense not leave you, friends.